All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started and then uh, I'll watch the, the waiting room and we'll admit other people into the room as we do when we meet in real life. So good morning, good afternoon now. Sorry, it's been a long day. Good afternoon, I'm Catherine Henshaw with the Center for Ideas and Society and it's our pleasure to host this session. Um, and, and we're really excited that folks are not so exhausted by Zoom, or even if they are, they're balancing that out by joining us here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, as I was saying a few minutes ago, push back. It's frustrating that all of our plans and our research seems to stall. Um, we can't even go outside and we can't engage with people and get feedback on our work. This is a critical thing to do with our research. So in some sense, we're saying no to COVID by being here today. And I really, really appreciate that. So um, welcome. We have three panelists in this session, uh, Performing Arts. We have uh, Herman Huda from Music. We have Jamil Jr. Barrera Garcia and Preeti Ramaprasad from Dance. And we have two respondents. We have Anusha Kadar, Assistant Professor uh, in the Dance Studies Department. And we have Eric Johns. He's a graduate student in the Music Department. Um, so what we thought we would do with everyone's approval and participation is we would allow the speakers to present their papers and speakers I would just ask that for those that might not know you from the other departments say your name and your paper title just before you launch so folks have a point of reference as they begin to listen to your work. I'm sure your paper titles will be in your slides as well. And then after we hear the papers, we'll hear from our respondents who will give us a few comments and questions to sort of organize the conversation that follows. And then since we're an intimate group, we can um, listen to your voices as you ask questions. You can unmute yourself when you ask your questions or if it's easier for you and it makes more sense for what's going on in your background to type questions into the chat window, I'll monitor that and I'll be able to share those questions at the end as well. Any questions before we roll forward? And I will just remind everyone, you should see a notice on your screen. We are recording this session so that we can share this with folks who are not able to, to physically be with us virtually right now as we do this meeting. All right, then without further comment from me, we will begin with our first speaker. Herman, you, we are ready for you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the invitation to share my presentation with you today. And um, I am going to start um, um, sharing my screen with you, as well as uh, what we, I already have set up the, the computer sound. So, um, okay. Well, my presentation's uh, title is uh, Ricardo Lorenz, a postcolonial modern Latino American composer. The introduction. Ricardo Lorenz's music focuses on the concept of transculturation, first conceived by the scholar Fernando Ortiz to conceptualize the Cuban cultural context in the mid 20th century. Transculturation is also understood by Lawrence as the phenomenon of two mutually influential musical cultures. Quote, it entails the circulation of ideas in both directions, resulting in an interdependent network of mutual influences. End of the quote. This presentation explores the role of transculturation, postmodern and postcolonial theory in Lawrence's work to demonstrate the Latin American Latino composers' contributions to Western art music, which they have accomplished by bringing forth a subtle universe of sounds shaped by its cultural history. Subtitle, Venezuela, Latin American art music, and the United States. The Venezuelan cultural mestizaje, a more complex and extended phenomenon that the basic race mixture has created distinct layers of subtle cultural webs in the country. This sociocultural future has molded the music making process in Venezuela by incorporating complex layers of communities, identities, belief, genres, and styles. With respect to its art music, Venezuela, like other Latin American countries, has been working for uh, centuries 
to build a tradition that cohabits with the country's folk and popular music styles, generated as a cultural product from a Venezuelan context. Lorenz's generation was surrounded and impacted by a broad palette of musical genres beyond art music, such as salsa, pop, rock, jazz, and folk. And with its public conservatories, private music schools, and El Sistema, Venezuela musical tradition emphasized participation in music making and sharing it as a cultural experience. In Lorenz's words, quote, you are raised with music being a part of the family, end of the quote. Ricardo Lorenz uh, emigrated to the United States in 1982, where he attended the J Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. At this school, among many uh, music, music instructors and colleagues whose work has contributed to shaping Lorenz's musical voice, the composer himself emphasizes the impact of his mentor in composition, the eminent late Chilean composer musicologist Juan Orrego Salas, who was the director of the Latin American Music Center at Indiana University. Together, both composers convert the space of the Latin American Music Center uh, library from an intractable deposit for cultural texts and historical memory into a vibrant location with Latin American music performances and conferences. With this work, the people who participated in these performances and conferences transformed the, sp excuse me, the space from archive into, quote, repertoire of embodied practice and knowledge, end of the quote, as defined by Diana Taylor. Then he moved to Chicago, where he concluded his PhD in composition at the University of Chicago, worked as a composer in residence for the Harmonia Musicians Residence Program, sponsored by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. In this role as a cultural community liaison, Lawrence decided to work with the local band Sones de Mexico. Instead of bringing European art music to the local community of Latin American Latinos and Chicanos. In 2005, Lauren was appointed as an associate professor of composition at Michigan State University in East Lansing, where he relaunched the festival Latin East America, which, quote, focused on musical, artistic, and scholarly events that celebrate the blending of Latin American and U.S. cultures, end of the quote. Subtitled Ricardo Lorenz, his music, transculturalism, postmodernity, and postcolonialism. Postcolonial and postmodern composers like Lorenz are attentive to the fact of displaying agency as well as placing culture in the center and not the periphery of their compositional works. Accordingly, Lorenz often explicitly connects his compositions to issues of politics, migration, technology, diaspora, globalization, gender, class, and race. His objective centers on, quote, the constructing the intellectual, uh, intellectual framework that fuels current characterizations of Latin American art music, end of the quote, because it has been ghettoized by the Western art music canon. Consequently, Latin American music becomes the other in Western spaces. And as Yara El Gadam argues, quote, the other is, tr is treated as an object of Western musical representation, but rarely is he or she treated as a subject and thus an active participant in and contributor to Western art music. In fact, the postcolonial other ceases to be an object and suddenly comes to life only when the repertoire studied or generous examined move from art music to, to popular and hybrid uh, music." End of the quote. Walter Mignolo believes that decolonization is possible when epistemologists deconstruct Western logos, Eurocentrism, and Christianity from a third world per perspective. Stuart Hall, also shares a similar discourse of descent, which can be found in the postcolonial narrative. 
developed by third world, third world intellectuals and artists who look forward to displacing Eurocentrism by revising it and proposing a different methodology. In other words, Latin American and Latino composers like Lawrence design and construct a challenge from a third world art music perspective to the dominant culture of the European Western world. A similar discourse of descent can be found in the post-colonial decolonization narrative which has been developed by third world composers who look forward to displacing Eurocentrism, etc. Therefore, inside this aesthetic political context, Latin American and Latino art music composers strive to generate new, differentiated, and emancipated meanings, webs of connections and functions, and at the same time, overcome the reality of past century of cultural colonialism. Latin American composers of our music create musical works by using the same order and system of fundamental musical elements, which is called music, uh, musical syntax, as their colleagues in Western art music. Nonetheless, and as a result of their history and culture, their compositions, meanings, which is music, musical semantics, as opposed, opposed to syntax, are different. This this is an outcome of the implied dialectics in Western music between periphery and he hegemonic center in which Latin American art music composers are positions outside of the Western art music tradition because of the external status of non-Western composers. Latin American composers must negotiate their musical identity within a Western dominated culture. They have had to construct themselves as the self inside the domain of the other. It is about redefining the position of the periphery, fringe, or marginality towards a productive and particip participative role in the discourse in terms of celebrating the difference, also a characteristic of postmodernity. With this political statement, Lawrence positioned himself in egalitarian terms inside the score with the Europeans, Euro-American composers, with the aim of exercising his own musical agency and generate a counter discourse. Pataruco. Pataruco, concerto for maracas and orchestra. We get a similar uh, Laurentian take on another classical art musical genre, the concerto. Laurent plays a marginal and exotic Native American instrument, the maracas, in, in, in the center of the narrative and the stage. By being cast as a solo instrument, the indigenous maracas percussion take the place of what is traditional a pitch instrument capable of producing sound in, in the Western tra tradition. No? In, in this music tradition, enhance, enhancement of the harmonic system signifies progress or evolution, while the rhythm is relegated to a secondary or supportive role. Lawrence inverts this relation of power between development mean by the mother and under development signified by the other. In other words, he positions the subaltern in the front, signifying a displacement of tradition within the concerto musical genre. The score becomes a hybrid text that encodes a challenge to hegemonic canonical discourses. Lawrence elevates the maracas not just to a solo position, but to a virtuous one. Listening and watching, which we are going to be doing now, the performance is in, of this musical work engage the audience not only with a masterful display of shaping musical phrases and dynamics coming from the maracas. The first and second movements allude to the music of the Venezuelan llanos, the plains, and its traditional music genres. In the second movement, the opening motif of the violin suggests tonadas, which are monodic songs associated with the cattle, ranchers, and farmers, various daily production labors, specifically with Sabana by the popular music and folklore artist Simon Diaz. Let's listen in a little bit of this. Excuse me.
I can check the link. It's a beautiful uh, piece of uh, the, uh, musical work, and yeah, I can check the link with, with, with you guys. Thank you. The next work, El Muro. Uh, Lawrence is the wall. Uh, uh, Lawrence political and musical activism not only eliminates the borders between art music and popular music, but also represents a political position with music. Lawrence engaged with the notion of artistic and political citizenship, freedom and circulation, circulation within the modern nation state and culture. Uh, communities, in particular, imaginary can construct the us and them in different ways. As he discussed in his program notes for El Muro, The Wall, he said, quote, at a conceptual level, El Muro is my response to how I feel about walls, whether these walls exist in reality or in our minds. I should mention that I was raised in a South American city where most homes are surrounded by walls topped with barbed wire. To put it simple, I was raised in a land of makeshift fortress. This is how I learned early on that walls not only exist to delineate a space, but also to keep people away. In my own imaginary way, El Muro humanized those people that walls uh, keep away by connecting them to their long-standing cultural traditions. As an adult, I learned that these traditions breed soulful, exciting, and sometimes even influential music capable of making even the most sturdy looking wall tumble down." End of the quote. Thus, for Lauren, the construction of identity and citizenship is mapped and especially positioned inside and outside of the borders, in this case, nation state borders, for all of those who have an image of a shared history, values, and traditions. The idealism and reality of a liberal nation state ultimately remain more on the paper of the constitution than in the daily life of the new citizens because the social contract has never necessarily been a racial contract. Therefore, the secular conceptualization of the consolidated imaginary construction of the modern nation state whose aesthetical, ideological, racial, and physical border include us and excludes them. In this sense, the nation state project, as mentioned, continues to reproduce exclusion patterns. Lawrence's work represents the fact that with the creation of nation states and its spatial re uh, reorganization of the territory, communities which circulated transnationally across these geographical spaces were separated. As a consequence, these migrant communities had to negotiate and reinvent their uh, identities. Let's listen in a little bit. to share the link of the piece with you. Conclusion. Ricardo Loren is a multidimensional musical and artistic personality whose music has been performed from Tito Puentes and Son Este Mexico to major international uh, symphony orchestras and soloists. Simultaneously, uh, Loren's musical language and aesthetic reflect his political philosophy fluent in cultural diversity which enriched his sonic world, and he accomplished this by incorporating both insider and outsider elements from the Western art music tradition and his home, Venezuela. Uh, Lawrence Music reminds us what the process of transculturation stands for, opening, opening new postcolonial and postmodern paths for creation and self-representation. And this context also challenged the composer to make aesthetical negotiations and decisions to contest canonical and exoticism constructions. Lawrence is aware of his belonging to a global world and its fluctuations, and though he has no aim of being labeled or mapped exclusively as Latino or Latin American composer or 
citizen, etc. Lawrence's identity and work reflect a strong connection with this culture without losing the great picture of the diverse musical traditions to which he's belong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so thank you so much, Herman. So now yeah. we will shift to our second speaker, Jamul. If you would like to share your slides or however you would like to proceed, we hand the podium over to you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you see the slides before I continue. Yeah. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jim Wall and you can call me Jim. I am a third year PhD student in critical dance studies with a designated emphasis in Southeast Asian studies here at East Riverside. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the Center for Ideas and Society Virtual Research Conference 2020 for doing a conference like this that gathers interdisciplinary work from graduate students whose conferences were either moved or canceled. As I begin, I would like to invite everyone who are watching and perhaps listening to put the palms over your hands where you can feel your heart beating. And we'll take a short pause as we listen to the pulse of our hearts. I then would like to invite you all, if you may, to move your palms forward in a sign of offering. At this point, I would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to our ancestors and the ancestors of the lands we are in, wherever we are, and to where I am from right now and to where most of us go to school, the original and current caretakers of our land, water, and air, the Kawiya, Tongva, Luisanio, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future, and also all the people who have come before us, who have fought for us to be here today in the academia. Many of us have benefited from their work and continues to engage with their legacies. I would like to acknowledge as well that we are in this time of the pandemic where everyone is coping to survive COVID-19 and that it affects different communities in different ways. I also acknowledge the importance of the virtual and physical space that we are in and the things may have changed a lot especially as we await for the new normal. Let's put back our palms towards our heart. Thank you to all for this opportunity to gather virtually. You may now put your hands down. So today I'll be presenting my paper that has been developed for a class facilitated by Dr. Anthea Kraut, who's with us um, today as well in the dance department for the graduate course, Theorizing Race, Racing Dance. And it's entitled, Circling Through the Space of Affect When a Filipino Dances with Filipino Americans. If there was one thing that my Filipino body felt in trying to understand the Filipino American body in the last two years of being here in the United States of America, it was this potent mixture of confusion, questioning gaze, and an unsure feeling. Let me call it ambivalence. One of those moments was when I decided to formally quit attending the folk dance rehearsals of Katipunan after being present twice in their evening practices. This amazing UCR recognized organization composed mostly of second generation Filipino Americans was months ahead in preparation for the most anticipated cultural event the Filipino Cultural Night, which is supposed to happen this month or next month. It is an annual program participated in by thousands of students, mostly Filipino Americans. For curator of Asian Pacific American history and associate professor of American studies, Dr. Theodore Gonzalez, the production of PCN serves as a rite of passage for one's confrontation and refashioning of what it means for its participants to be Filipino Americans. 
It became the most popular expressive cultural endeavor for the increasing number of young Filipino Americans in addressing their bodies, quote, to what has been perceived as the irreversibility of linear time, the inevitability of national formations, and the incommensurability of the Filipino experiences throughout the diaspora, end quote. In my own encounter with Katipunan, I felt mediocre, but trying, curious, but dissatisfied, and clarified, but also baffled. Then, as I was composing an email with the intention of not coming back due to the cloud of doubtful bodily responses I had with the ongoing rehearsals, I started to ask myself, why do I feel this way? My presentation today is a slice of a full paper that nuances my experience of ambivalence and places it in conversation with theories of racial and national affect. What I am attempting to nuance in this research in conversation with race making in dance is the circulation of a simultaneously emerging but discordant affect that seemed to escape articulation. I focused my analysis on one of my two dance experiences with Filipino American bodies in the last two years, and that transpired during the folk dance rehearsals. I will draw from associate professor in the Department of Black Studies and English, Dr. Stephanie Batiste's formation of kinetic affect, and feminist writer and independent scholar, Sarah Amid's positioning of the Orient as a social framework to argue that my affective dance experience may help illuminate how the engagement of Filipino bodies with Philippine folk dance, both national and diasporic bodies, are persistently haunted by the legacies of Western imperialism. But also that contrary to a commonplace of viewing Filipino bodies as colonized bodies, the possibility that Filipino bodies may also perpetuate the legacies of the empire is also imminent. That is, the Filipino dancing body is also capable of reproducing the power structure that was imposed upon them by the imperial project. Having said this, I contend that the perpetuation of imperialism through the Filipino bodies involved may have materialized and may be read in three ways. One, as a spur for the production of effective responses. Second, as a relentless pressure that maintains the circulation of ambivalence. And finally, as an after effect of being trapped in the narrative of racism. That is to say that the nightmares of Western imperialism are concealed, sustained, and projected by Filipino bodies as they cross paths, perhaps unnoticed and bearable in their homelands, but more apparent and unbearable in their interaction while in the diaspora. I remember that during the rehearsals, I started to feel uncomfortable about learning the folk dances I was assigned because of the disparities in the way those folk dances were taught to me, how I experienced learning them from my folk dance teachers and the restaging of the folk dance itself. This accumulated experience that left me ambivalent seemed to diverge from what Batiste offered as kinetic affect, which became a means for her to understand the dancer's formation of community within dance practice and its spaces. She pinpoints kinetic affect as a flowing presence in the performance of crumping and clowning among young hip hop dancers of Los Angeles, California, which in turn, quote, enforces kinetic affect of resonating com communal connection, end quote. In contrast, I contend that what was missed as a circulating impulse in my experience is what Batiste refers to as the kinetic affect that creates communality. Instead, in my immersion with Filipino Americans, there seems to be an impending resurrection of the legitimacy of American imperial power. That the Filipino bodies, both in the Philippines and the diaspora, were reiteratively re manipulated to dance through the choreography of the Western Empire. Thus, I argue that my Filipino body and that of the Filipino Americans shared a dual performativity one that engaged with Philippine folk dances that was made aware of our helping hand in maintaining the empire, and another that moved in the moment of encounter for the survival of the empire. At the onset of the paper, I began by pointing out an effective gap between my Filipino body and that of Filipino Americans. 
Building from that premise, I forward that Filipino bodies, both in the homeland and the diaspora, are essentially performing the same thing, bodies that dance through the disciplining of the imperial project. I assert that to disrupt the empire's maneuvers, the Filipino, Filipino-American dancing body should establish their engagement in folk dance with a confrontation of one's lived reality. In the words of Filipino Athabascan and Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Alaska Anchorage, Dr. E.J. David, this lived reality may come to a Filipino as an internalization of colonial oppression that may be seen as a, quote, very deep and solidified sense of weakness, vulnerability, and invisibility that brown skin colonized and forgotten person of color, end quote, have embodied, which they cannot just simply brush off. In the context of my affective experience, grasping my live reality means sharing the moment, dancing in the present, and acknowledging the forces which brought two different bodies together. A nonstop conversation with one's Filipino-ness that never stops being affected, bothered, and conflicted. An act of challenging the normative which for Amid is, quote, an effect of the repetition of bodily actions over time. End quote. Perhaps this proposition out of my relative experience may shed light on what difference would it make when the body is made aware or, or is aware of where, how, and why it is orientated the way it is as the body decides to learn a certain folk dance. Although what I experienced was a different take on Batiste's theorization of kinetic affect, what was thought-provoking for me was seeing my affective experience as a mode of corporeality. The inextricability of affect from the body as it mingles with other bodies through my experiences may have just shown how a body can make theory when exposed to such situations. For Batiste, the actions of the body in the dance and performance environment became a space for the body to theorize its movement through its physical expansiveness. In my case, the affective circuit became my epistemological space for understanding the reaction of my body. Both Batiste's example and my experience show how sociality is seen as relationality as my body extends itself to the community where the transitive nature of affects may be circulated. What became accessible, which was then unspoken of or unquestioned for, was the articulation of a thriving charge coming from America's imperial legacy that the Filipino body in the Philippines and the diaspora tried to negotiate by feeling ambivalent or not feeling quite right, in the words of Munoz. For Professor of Queer Politics and Aesthetics, Dr. Jose Esteban Munoz, to deal with not being quite right, one has to look at the circulation of affect built in relationality. As Dr. Munoz pointed out, quote, affect is supposed to be a descriptive of the receptors we use to hear each other and the frequencies on which certain subalterns speak and are heard of, or more importantly, felt, end quote. The notions of deeply rooted national consciousness as a quest pursued in the process of learning a specific folk dance becomes apparent as Filipino bodies search what it means for them to engage in a colonially influenced and imperially shaped activity such as folk dance or folk dancing. It seemed to me that such experience may be considered as an effective cultural framework in nuancing racial meanings and constructing a temporally and spatially charged body. For Munoz, my experience of ambivalence may shed light on what feeling brown is all about. Quote, a mode of racial performativity, a doing within the social that surpasses limitations of epistemological renderings of race. End quote. So how will the Filipino body wake up from the hunting of white supremacist hierarchies and corporeal constructions? Ignoring it just stalled my movement experience. Escaping it was unavoidable either. However, feeling ambivalent in being bothered, in questioning, 
and uncertainty, the Filipino body may be able to take the first step towards finding its way out of the darkness of being caged as docile bodies. That to wake up is to immerse in the affective circuit of ambivalence to defy the lobotomizing impact of racialization. That to disrupt and break free from notions of racial identities, one should persist in kinesthetically and effectively mobilizing the Filipino body to move and never stop moving, whatever the cost. Therefore, ambivalence in the end may be read as a transgressive act of fighting back and unsettling the circling choreography of the empire that is capable of circulating, pulsating, and dancing despite the uncertainties that Filipino bodies sensorially and effectively experience. In this sense, the implications of how race circulates in the constitution of the social and bodily space of an individual are vital. It may help one understand how bodies can arrive in corporeal negotiations that do not only refute the hunting of the silhouettes of white supremacy, but instead uphold a space where bodies can encourage each other to move despite the truths claimed by the project of race. It is in the space of embracing each other's embodiment that racialized bodies may adaptly move freely despite knowing that dancing through it will never be pain-free. That in dancing through the toolbox of the empire, the Filipino body may be able to attune itself to a differently navigated choreographic agency that subverts the empire's canonized notation and establishes alternative pathways towards learning Philippine folk dances. Looking back, I ask, why do I feel this way? In closing, perhaps I would say, I should feel this way. Thank you to all the mentors that helped me when I discussed this paper and that's my bibliography. So that's it, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Jamil. Thank you for the paper and for that thoughtful introduction at the beginning, I really. Uh, appreciated that personally as well. Thank you. And now, Preeti, would you like to share your slides and present your work as well? Is that visible for everyone? Great, okay. Um, thank you so much for this space. Um, thank you, Jem, for your um, um, acknowledgement. Um, I echo those sentiments and I'm thankful to be here. This paper is the beginning of an inquiry. I'm a second year in the critical dance studies department. Um, and this is the result of a paper that I wrote for a class. So it's at the, it's, I'm at the beginning stages of some research. Um, and um, I really appreciate the space to share um, this very um, initial stage of my um, questioning. Um, my paper is called Nandanan, Invi uh, Visibilizing Cast in Bharatanatyam. The stage is empty, but for the mellifluous orchestra and vilaka, or golden Indian standing lamps, which illuminate and decorate the space. The tambura, or musical drone, is humming softly before a burst of energy from the vocalist when the dancer comes on stage. She's dressed like a goddess, gingerly moving every limb of her body lively from one position to another, and she ends in a pose in the middle of the stage, addressing the main deity of the poem, with the Anjali Mudra, known in yoga circles as Namaste, with her hands together as a sign of bowing and humility. 
It is hard to imagine her bowing, wearing immaculate costuming. One feels that they must bow to this goddess of movement who has just taken over the stage. But only the trained spectator who understands the language of the poetry would understand in that moment, this dancer is portraying an outcast in society, a Dalit, untouchable man named Nandanar who is not allowed to enter most temples. What are the implications of a Bharatanatyam dancer? dressed head to toe in golden jewels and silk finery in the formal proscenium stage, performing a piece that undeniably has to do with caste and class. While Bharatanatyam dancers reflect on the plight of their predecessors, hereditary dancers, a caste and community known as Devadasis, from a feminist lens, the impact of caste and class are often overlooked. When researching and attempting to showcase this through affect and performance on stage, I rediscovered the story of Nandanar. Many Bharatanatyam dancers perform excerpts of his story in the second half of their margams or standard Bharatanatyam repertory performances. Here, while the Dalit Nandanar is male and a different caste, he is portrayed with a specific stance and character during performances. I aim to study the effects of this expression through choreographic analysis of Bharatanatyam performance and film which tell his story. This Tamil figure's life is widely told through the poetry of one specific author, a Brahmin high caste man named Gopalakrishna Bharati. Bharati sang and wrote a series of poems, the Nandanar Charitram, which chronicles Nandanar's stories as such. Born into a Dalit family, Nandanar worked the fields for a cruel landlord, but longed to sing and dance inside a Shiva Hindu god temple. One night, he asked the landlord to be allowed to leave early, and the landlord gave him a particularly large workload to complete first. Nandanar miraculously completed his chores and went to the Shiva temple. Prevented from going inside due to his caste, he sat outside the temple and sang songs about Shiva. <laughs> Further, the Nandi, or the bull deity that sits facing Shiva in all temples, was blocking his view. Excuse me one second. The music that Bharati depicts says, my view or path is blocked like a mountain. A cow or bull is laying down across it. The story describes the Nandi moving for Nandana to view Shiva. In this picture, you can see that the bull is to the side of the centered picture. And that is how the architecture is um, in that particular temple today. Nandanar's official, um, the story describes the Nandi moving for Nandanar to view Shiva. Later, Nandanar visits the Chidambaram temple, famous for where Shiva himself is said to have danced. Here, he walks through fire to attain a, quote, higher status to see him inside the temple. Nandanar's official cause of death is actually immolation, although oral history accounts suggest that the fire purified him to join Shiva. In this paper, I interrogate representations of this through the lens of Judith Butler's notions of performance versus the performative. Both representations are publicly produced films, but one is a Bharatanatyam film, which is by Bala Devi Chandrasekhar in collaboration with Swati Soft Solutions that mimics a stage performance on a DVD. The other is an excerpt from a movie telling the story of Nandanan. With respect to the 2011 Bharatanatyam portrayal of Nandanad by Bala Devi Chandrasekhar, I ask if the gesture of Nandanad is performing rather than enacting change. Using Jose Munoz's theorization of the gesture, I ask if the quote, lack of historical and political context in performance can still allow the spectator to question caste. Therefore, I understand her performance as lacking in performativity, per Butler's definition, because it fails to create discourse around the main idea of Nandanat's story. As a contrast, I study the 1942 film Nandanat and understand the same character's portrayal through Anurima Banerjee's writing on the distributed body. I examine how this contributes to making the portrayal performative rather than just a performance. Through these two performances, I aim to underscore the importance of performative representation of caste through Nandanar's story. This is a picture of Bala Devi Chandrasekhar. 
She continues her performance, invoking the story of Nandana, trying to see Shiva from outside the temple. Although dressed in glimmering gold, it is clear that Chandrasekhar is portraying the indigent Nandana. Throughout the piece, her shoulders are hunched forward and her elbows are dropped, a sharp contrast to her stiff chin and straight back in the rhythmic sequence introducing the dance. She stands leaning forward, pleading to the main deity for the lyrics, Varugalamo Aya. Is there any way I may be able to come inside? Am I worthy of coming inside, O oh Lord? This is the temple where this occurs. Nandanar here is referring to his inability to be allowed inside the temple because of his status as an untouchable man in society. The sharp contrast between the attire and choreography of the dancer as a performer before she transitions into the character of Nandanar is marked by these words. Watching this dancer portray Nandanat is similar to how other Bharatanatyam dancers are trained to signify his and similar characters who are marginalized or humbled. When I was learning to play the role of Hanuman, for example, who plays, who displays servitude to the god Rama, I used a similar positioning. A bent stance with, a relaxed, with relaxed joints offers, offered as a contrast to the disciplined, taut Bharatanatyam body serves as a distinct difference in caste and class that is iterative, thereby invoking Judith Butler's notion of gender as well. This is the first way that Butler's work functions in my analysis of Nandana. The knowledge of Nandana's character itself through the iterative behavior that is used to signify his position, the trope of a humble bent back and hunched shoulders. Butler mentions that materialization requires, quote, first forcible reiteration. This reiteration for Bhartanatyam dancers who are trained to watch Chandrasekhar signifying can immediately relate to Nandanar. Secondly, Butler claims that the agency denoted by performativity will be directly counter to any notion of a voluntary subject who exists quite apart from the regulatory norms which he or she opposes. She describes performativity as a symbolic act, which can be quote cited, that brings about the quote materialization of a certain agency. In her other work, Performative Acts, she refers to social action requiring a performance. Through both readings, I view Butler's performativity as different from performance because of its distinct engagement with the political. Essentially, performativity in the case of Nandana would involve interacting with the issue of casteism and classism within his character. Nandana's caste and position in Indian society are part of the performed iterative behavior in Bharatanatyam choreography, thereby allowing dancers to not only portray his character without introspecting on the representation of caste, but also perhaps allowing them to hide behind the character that they play on stage. Jose Munoz states that he's not interested in what gestures mean, but only in what they perform. In this instance, observing the Bhartanatyam performance involves first understanding how the theatrical representation of the poetry carries its meaning as a means of visually translating Bharati's poetry. Second, the performance of this gesture involves the surroundings, which is the summation of costuming, staging, and the identities of the people who are retelling the story of Nandana. How are they representing him and his personality theatrically? Munoz's argument undermines gestures that do not engage with the quote, historical and political context, as he calls it an impossibility. Some of the YouTube comments for this performance are, excellent singing and dancing, amazing performance, and one singular comment about Nandana himself. I feel the pangs of Nandana. Mostly, the notes are not about the representation of the man Nandana, but rather the dancer's performance of a man who's disenfranchised and her ability to play his situation in an effective manner. This effectiveness is measured, again, not by the representation of Nandana, but by the ability for people to feel or to understand his signification. Therefore, the performance of Nandana in Bharatanatyam is measured not through actually discussing caste, the main aspect of the story, but by subverting the gaze from the character to the dancer. 
In doing so, the dancer might claim that she's discussing caste through performing this society story, but is actually critically not engaging with the issue of caste in Bhartanatyam. Utilizing Butler's comparison of the performance and the performative leads one to think that the Bhartanatyam signification of Nandanal is not actually a performative act because it cannot engage with the, performative, with the politics of casteism as the story requires. It is a performance. To compare, I viewed one of the film versions of the same song and the same line where Nandanat is portrayed by a male actor standing alone in front of the temple premises. Due to its popularity, Nandanar's story has been created on film multiple times. Here, I analyzed the 1942 version starring Dandapani Desikar, who sang and acted the part of Nandanar. It must be noted that Desikar was a Brahmin actor, and the direction, musical, and otherwise was also done by Brahmin figures in the industry, revealing the gross lack of representation at the time and even today. In this scene, he sings and is not physically mobile. He simply stands with his hands together in Anjali as if praying, but not utilizing the movements that are choreographed by Bhartanatyam gestures. The song serves as a musical monologue for him to ask for entrance into the temple. Additionally, the Dwaja Stamba or the temple flagpole known and what is known as the temple tank, a man-made body of water placed before many temples where people cleanse their feet before entering the premises are clearly visible. These elements entail the setting of the event near the temple, adding to the relatability of the experience. This film, although in black and white, gives the viewer a feeling of being excluded from a religious experience along with the actor himself. In this way, the representation of Nandana begins to become performative. Anrima Banerjee discusses the distributive body as it relates to Mahari dance. In her work, she notes that the dancing body also carries the history and cultural context that location and architecture lend to performance. Although there is an inherent distance with the film when viewed through the screen, the presence of the temple setting adds to the discussion of exclusion, which might be harder to understand and discuss when watching Bhartanatyam concert dance. When his, with his costuming and stance a contrast to a concert performance, Nandanar here becomes a distributed body in the screen, his presence containing the location, history, and exclusionary politics of the story. Through both the characterization of Nandanat as well as his setting, this performance deliberately interacts with the politics of untouchability. A glimpse into the history of this film reveals the potentiality of this performativity and its accompanying pitfalls. Daysikar's portrayal of the character pictured here is, was widely praised and is the most popular, but the film was also banned for a period of time after a protest of Dalits in the South Indian town of Kolar Goldfields. The protests were regarding an over-romanticization of the end of Nandanar's story, where he was lit on fire to become a quote higher caste. It was not until Desikar himself publicly attended the rally and apologized to the people of Kolar Goldfields for being part of such a scene that the movie was brought back to audiences. The fact that this filmic representation had such an impact on populations is testament to its inherent performativity. The 1942 film Nandana demonstrates how performativity is an ongoing process, not a singular or binary entity through a given performance. In one scene, his position in society can create dialogue because of his exclusion. In another scene, Nandana's immolation being glorified also creates a political space of response. The value of Nandana Charitram has wide political impact. Today, during Karnatic and Bhartanatyam performances, Karnatic being South Indian classical music, the word Parayan has been taken out of the song Varagalamo because it is a derogatory epithet for untouchable and is also the origin of the word Pariah. Em eminent Indian classical vocalist T.M. Krishna asks if this omission is truly progressive or if it actually furthers the erasure faced by people affected by blatant casteism in India. This demonstrates that not just the story, but also the musical representations of Gopalakrishna Bharati's Nandana Charitram have immense potential to be performative. During the post 
independence Harijan movement, Mahatma Gandhi spoke at the site of Nandanar's burning and called for the eradication of the caste system as well, citing Nandanar as not only a victim of discrimination, but also as an example of someone utilizing nonviolent protest. This viewpoint met with some opposition among Dr. B.R. Ambedkar and other anti-casteism advocates like the Dravidian self-respect movement who felt like Nandanar's character came across as submissive rather than agentive. Caste continues to plague India's political and social environment. It impacts the Bharatanatyam field as it relates to the Devadasi, but also in unspoken ways that are not discussed. It's often represented in social webs that manifest themselves through financial and performance opportunities because social organizers and arts administrator, administrators have monetary and friendly relationships with people of similar, read, high caste. T.M. Krishna is one artist who discusses several microaggressions that indicate an unwillingness for the greater public to accept the lasting biases that caste still has on the field of arts, among others. I end with some further questions for inquiry. Although I'm discussing a film and a Bharatanatyam performance, this is the beginning of my inquiry into what performers of Bharatanatyam are aiming to accomplish and are accomplishing in their signifying or portraying of characters from history and mythology. I'm not arguing against a Bharatanatyam portrayal of these stories as a practitioner myself. I believe the art form has many tools for representation from gestures to expression or rasa that can engage with the political. But I am questioning the iterative nation, nature of how it is often practiced as a hindrance to this cause. Does iteration hinder performativity? What are performers trying to accomplish? An understanding of the emotions of Nandana or to engage with the political? Does it matter? What are tools in Bharatanatyam that can enable dancers who aim to be political to accomplish that? And how does spectatorship play a role? Thus, it's crucial to view the performance of Nandana with the great potential it has and understand the pitfalls of its representation. When dialogue that actually invokes caste and class as problematic is brought to the forefront, this story can be mobilized to understand greater social implications that still plague the Indian arts sector and beyond. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. So now we will turn to our respondents, Eric and Anisha, however you would like to navigate this and whenever you feel you are ready to move into question and answers, we can just seamlessly and organically do so. So we will hand it over to you. Great. Um, do you want, should I go first? Do you want to go first, Eric? Or? However you feel. Okay. Um, Thank you all for this wonderful, thank you for inviting me, first of all, to respond. And thank you for your wonderful presentations. It's honestly like some more interesting than some of the professional panels that I've been to. So thank you for that. It's really, all of your talks were uh, so interesting, so well put together and uh, such nice overlap between them and, and points of uh, conversation and tension also. Um, I think what I'll do is just kind of talk about what I noticed across your papers and then maybe focus on each one and uh, a question or a comment. Um, but I think what was interesting was thinking about the across all three, the, the post-colonial cultural formations and whether that's these harmonious, uh, forgive my uh, attempt to use musical knowledge here, <laughs> these harmonious hybridities or, or these discordant ruptures that um, occur in these post-colonial cultural formations was something that I noticed across the board and how culture can both uh, reveal and conceal um, these histories, right? Colonial and imperial histories. Um, I really appreciated too, Jem, your, um, your invocation and it, how beautiful it came right after um, uh, Herman, is am I saying that correctly? Is your name? Yeah, I think I, I think I had some problems with my internet, so I just uh, um, disconnected for a while and came back. Yeah. Oh, thank okay, you. okay. I just didn't know if I was saying your name correctly, but um, 
the way that you were talking about rhythm um, and then moving to Jem's thing of, of putting our hand onto our heart and, and what a beautiful kind of connection and transition um, that was. Um, for, for Herman's paper, I, I really, speaking about that rhythm, I, I'm not sure if this is common in, um, in your discipline, but I really appreciated the kind of contrast that you were drawing between rhythm and a kind of scale progression and thinking about the way in which those are viewed hierarchically within, um, within music. And that was uh, really insightful and interesting. And I, I also appreciated um, your invocation of Diana Taylor and thinking about embodiment too, and not just kind of music um, sound, the sonic as separate from the embodied. I think you might've frozen. I'm not sure if you're still there. Herman? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me move on to um, Jem and, and, and Preeti, whose work I know a little bit uh, more closely. Um, Jem, I was, I, there's such beautiful writing in this. This is my first time reading this paper and I thought it was um, really just beautifully, beautifully written. And there's the, there's the real gem, sorry for the pun, but real like gems within that in your writing. And I thought this idea of ambivalence as a transgressive act to unsettle the choreography of empire, this productive space and position um, of ambivalence that you were giving, um, and that it's through ambivalence that uh, we're able to kind of confront how you say the cultural imprints left by empire. And so I thought that was a wonderful and really, really generative um, direction. And I really hope that you can continue with this research because there's so much in there around this affect and ambivalence and, and the productive um, lens that it can, it can offer. Um, and the way that you're also grounding affect within the body, right? And not thinking about those as separate, the way affect theory can kind of feel very abstracted from the body. I think thinking about it as a mode of corporeality and as inextricably linked to the body was so, was so important. Um, I do have a question about um, in terms of Homi Baba's ambivalence because he, I know you're using it maybe in a slightly different way, but it seemed so, it would seem central or uh, important to kind of think about how he's using ambivalence within post-colonial discourse and how you're thinking about ambivalence in post-colonial discourse um, in a similar or different way. Um, and I also think there's a bunch of other references that I'll send you. I don't need to talk to you about it right now. But the other question that I had is we, in terms of the affective ambivalence or the affective experience that you're writing about and speaking about, it's from your, your affective experience. And so I wonder if you were to continue this research and through ethnography, thinking about what that affective experience is from the other side and how they, how they are viewing you in that space too, as a kind of, you know, are they viewing you as a kind of authentic body in that space? What's their relationship? What's, how does, what's the kind of back and forth that's going on there? Um, and, and not just from your perspective of Filipino American um, practitioners. So I think if you do continue this, and I hope that you do, that that perhaps that could be a part of um, your field work, you know, of thinking about your uh, their their affective perhaps ambivalence or not in relation to uh, in relation to you and and the kind of authentic uh, Filipino body. And I think Anna Scott's essay. Um, which the name of it is escaping me if Anthea or Linda can remember. Um, but Anna Scott's uh, essay on authenticity in the kind of in the studio of, of taking West African dance classes and wanting to deconstruct the, the, um, the self, but then at the same time, a uh, spectacle. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, but at the same time, you know, wanting to kind of embody an essentialized, uh, authentic blackness, right? Um, how she's viewed in that space. So I thought that could be an interesting thing to look at for your work, um, for this particular, um, for this particular research. And 
oh, my notes are everywhere here. But um, yeah, I think those are my two things for you of thinking about ambivalence in relation to post-colonial discourse, the way Baba looks at it and thinking about affective experience from the other, from the other side. And then uh, for Preeti, um, I, I was also, this is the first time I'm, I'm reading this work too, and it was so great. Um, I think that your focus on mythology and what mythology can tell us about Bharatanatyam um, and what mythology reveals and conceals about the history of Bharatanatyam and its politics is really, really important and how mythology itself is performative in terms of its own iterative um, aspect and qualities and its ability to uh, enact and construct identities that, that then get naturalized as, as the norm. Um, I think mythology, the focus on mythology is really, really strong. And this, this myth in particular is, you know, what I'm familiar with and, and I think thinking about why it's one of the few, if only real stories about caste that's performed in Bharatanatyam and what the power of, the, why the story keeps getting circulated and recirculated, um, one written by a Brahmin, performed by Brahmins, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't really, it's not just the performance, but the story itself is a narrative of caste that does nothing to dismantle caste, right? And it's it's all about how God opens the door and moves aside to let him in, but it doesn't talk about anything that would dismantle the structure or the systemic issues around caste. So it's a very comfortable narrative for Brahmins to um, continue to perform because it doesn't require them to change anything, right? Um, and so I wonder also about the potential of this narrative. You end by saying that it's possible that this story can be mobilized um, and has potential to, to, to draw out some of these issues in Darth Natyam. And so I wonder about the potential of this story that the very nature of the story doesn't really allow for any kind of dismantling of caste. So um, is there a way in which how it's performed could do that or is it or are there other narratives that might be more suited to dismantling or, or understanding questions of caste within Bharatanatyam? Um, yeah, um, let's see what else I just really quickly. Um, oh, the other thing that I wanted to ask or I was thinking about is that there's so many differences between the film and the live performance too. I mean, apart from just one being live and one being film, um, but also the orientation of the spectator, right? The proscenium versus in film allowing for different orientations, um, a male body versus a female body, um, questions of form also in terms of acting versus dancing, um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of other uh, other comparisons and and points of um, analysis between the film and the live performance that could be teased out um, to think about why one functions in one way and the other functions in another way, or why one represents caste or has the affective kind of experience. Um, one kind of affective, affective experience versus another. Um, and that's the other thing I think both of you, what was interesting too, is that um, they, that both of yours talk about how dance can, can seduce audiences and practitioners into thinking that they're enacting anti-caste or anti-imperial politics when in fact they're actually reinscribing them, right? and how an attention to not just representation, um, but also affect, right? And with Jem, it's the, the, the feeling of ambivalence and with Preeti's paper, it's the, the audience's enjoyment of the dance, right? And their ability to, to feel Nandanar, right? That affective experience that provides a lens for us to see this disjuncture um, that, that you're talking about. And I thought that's a really important space for dance studies. It's a really important opening that goes beyond 
that, that draws on choreographic analysis, but also goes beyond choreographic analysis. And so I think um, that was lovely to see and, and really interesting to see that, that overlap. But um, sorry, I know I've been talking for a long time. I'll talk to both of you more. I have lots of other comments and stuff, but I'll, uh, I'll let Eric talk now. Um, I'm actually going to try to piggyback on some of those ideas because a lot of the thoughts for the things that I know of, um, I also kind of saw the through line for all the papers as being this insertion of a subject into like a totality, a hegemonic totality as a political act, right? Um, and for one of the ways that we can look at that is within the concept of hybridity, hybridity which in Latin American studies we normally refer to as transculturation, as Hermann used. But so one of the ways that I see it being useful for like in what you were talking about, Jim, is a, again, following up on Homi Baba, but Homi Baba's talking on, on hybridity, uh, taking off of Bakhtin's organic hybridity, which I don't think Bakhtin views as being political, but Bobby definitely takes it as, as political. And the, the distinction of that is that it's a hybridity that doesn't um, doesn't necessarily bring attention to itself. It's not necessarily obvious that it's um, hybrid. And it's actually really, really close to Fernando Ortiz's idea of transculturation, which I want to mostly focus on because it's what I know the most about and ask a question to Herman. And maybe to, to you guys as well, if you're not familiar with transculturation, since it seems to be pretty limited to Latin American studies, so it's a it's a really popular term in Latin American studies for the last 70 years. Um, but in the last 30 years, it's taken on a particular meaning in the post-colonial world, particularly within the Latin American studies subaltern study group to mean that they have a political meaning. But that political meaning isn't in Ortiz. Ortiz is about um, the individuals, is about, he's trying to make this replacement term for acculturation um, and it's about the individual it's not about the group in Ortiz and the process of transculturation turns into this process of neoculturation and it's not actually really um, very clear in Ortiz because of that 600 some pages of Cuban counterpoint only like six or seven are dedicated to transculturation and it's it's there so the critiques that started in the 90s with the subaltern studies group of transculturation from like John Beverly and um, Alberto Moreas is that it's not political. Um, so in Lorenz's version of transculturation, it is political, right? And you have these two mutually influential cultures and their circulation and ideas between both. There's a dialectic between them, which is, again, another thing you don't see in Ortiz. So rather than Ortiz, what I want to kind of maybe suggest is that Lorenz is actually coming from Angel Rama, transculturation, uh, and which Rama is an Uruguayan literary theorist who was also very big in Latin American studies. I'm sure you're familiar um, in the tr transcultural narrative in Latin America. He talks about how the Latin American author... Um, takes takes localized elements elements from latin america <clears throat> and incorporates them into a U u.s or european avant-garde tradition and that is the way that we create a latin american art properly to itself that's his version of transculturation um and it is that taking of the localized inserting into the european hegemonic discourse that produces that kind of transculturation which i see the maracas as as being that in, in Pataruco, right? That is a, a very good example of Rahma, Rama's idea of transculturation, but less so of Ortiz's. So my question is, what is Lorenz's engagement with Ortiz directly, or is he following, because most people haven't read the original Ortiz text, and that's fine, but we're taking these ideas that are coming through, um, through these other places through John Beverly, for, through Alberto Moreas, through Cornejo Polar, uh, through Angel Rama, and making them something that they are. I think that they're valuable interpretations of Ortiz's work, 
but what is Lawrence's um, engagement with uh, Ortiz's literature and or what would the liter ref his engagement be with um, uh, other ideas of transculturation? What does he say specifically in his texts about it? Um, and then for everybody else, we want to open it up a little bit to think about the ways that hybridity as 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 this idea that, that the the other in in a hybrid subject is always political whether or not that is always the case it can someone be an other within a hegemonic system and not be political depending on who you want to read of course there's a lot of different ways to go to that so i'll leave my question for for herman i think that i have an actual explicit question for him on that uh to summarize and i'll shut up then um what what is lorenz's engagement with literature on transculturation or is it his uh, interpretation of it coming from a, a different discourse? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you to um, Preti and Jamil for their presentations as well as you all guys to be present here. So, um, you know, Lawrence, he, he wrote in his dissertation, PhD dissertation, basically that Latin American composers are in the vacuum. He also uh, contests the notion that transculturation is a concept that it hasn't been really studied in art music because we have had this Eurocentric narrative, which is basically an ideology that, uh, you know, and is also supporting the idea of acculturation, which is also the concept that Ortiz is trying to defeat epistemologically speaking in terms of, um, you know, uh, European art music represent itself at, as I said, as the self, as an entity that uh, it has been created only in Europe and in real, and reality, European art music and European culture in general has borrowed so much by those other cultures, uh, and sorry for using the expression, but for by non-Europeans uh, uh, cultures. And uh, even though, uh, or, in, or, or in addition to that, in, in Europe, inside Europe, there is this also hierarchy division of you know some countries like Germany, France, Italy that represents quote unquote the culture with capital C of Europe which is not true and there are also the internal order like Bulgaria, Spain, etc. So within the, the, the European context there is also these hierarchical differences. So um, basically European art music has constructed itself by borrowing so much by non-European cultures and uh, even though the European art music historiography doesn't recognize that at all so we have this ideology that talks about genius and master work so uh, music works and uh, composers in this case that are, do not have any connection with any any cultural and social and race and class social class uh, context. So um, uh, Lawrence basically uh, challenged that, and also the notion that uh, as a result of the asymmetrical encounter between Europe and this continent that is called America, which was not the original name because America is also a name that it was imposed by the Europeans uh, after uh, America was pushy. Um, um, Europe changed completely and tremendously. So in history, we have this historiography that has been basically reproducing this a canonical and also a hegemonic narrative that the discovery and um, and and it doesn't acknowledge how much uh, Europe changed as a result with the encounter with this continent that we call nowadays uh, America. So we can project that into the culture too. So this is what uh, actually uh, Lawrence is is one of the many things he's refuting in in his texts. Um, and um, yeah, this is one of them. 
So this is this is why for him the term transculturation is so meaningful in his music because European uh, classical music ideology also has been taken away uh, uh, since ever the agency of Latin American composers, art music composers, and, and non-Europeans are music composers. So um, uh, basically categorizing uh, these musical texts as a you know, byproducts, uh, you know, copies of the metropole. So we have this back and forth between, you know, the European self and, and the others, I mean, basically, you know. All right, Pretty, do you, do you wanna go next or I can just jump in? You go ahead, okay. go ahead. All right. Perfect. Um, thank you for um, the feedback and the question, um, Anusha and Eric, and thank you as well, Herman and everybody for, um, Herman for presenting and Priti and everybody for being here. Um, these are really complex questions. One is on um, Homi Baba's um, ambivalence that Anusha um, uh, posed as a question. And it is interesting because um, Homi Baba's idea of hybridity is supposed to be an empowering act of um, subverting how the colonizers look at colonized bodies and that it should be a way of navigating these um, hegemonic spaces um, where one would be able to like subvert the narratives of colonial power and in this case for example in dance um, hybridity Hybridity, Homi Baba's hybridity in particular, is very complex when I try to put it in conversation with Filipino bodies, who also, as some scholars noted, um, Filipino scholars, in, Filipino and Filipino American scholars in particular, noted that um, Filipino bodies are hy hybrid bodies as well, and that the product of their engagement with folk dance is in itself hybrid. The space itself is hybrid. So um, I would re really be interested to look into how Homi Baba is navigating um, hybridity and bringing in the idea of um, ambivalence because I, from what I can remember, um, Homi Baba um, also cited how colonial mimicry resulted to these ideas of ambivalence and um, uh, hybridity. And this idea of colonial mimicry is very fascinating to me because the way that some of the folk dances in the Philippines were developed is through mimicking or observing how the Spaniards were dancing in, in a particular, say, dance hall, and they were not allowed to participate in those spaces. So um, I've shared this to Anusha before, but for the sake of those who are listening, the way that Filipinos during the Spanish period were able to learn some of the Spanish influenced folk dances in the country were by, by just standing at the side because they were not allowed to participate. And in that very personal space, they tried to um, have their own take on what they see as dances that the Spaniards were um, performing in front or sharing or dancing in front of them. So the the way that these dances has changed, for example, um, polka or valse into the Filipino body and the way the Filipino body has stylized their own take on these folk dances is something that I think has to be interrogated in as much as um, I believe that folk dance in itself should be interrogated as well because for the most part, uh, at least from where I came from in the Philippines, the one's engagement with folk dance is not very much contested. We have a very established canon in place where Filipino bodies just abide with the notation and the lit dance literature that are there. And then the way that we actually try to, I think that the way that Filipino body tries to go against these um, canonized literature and canonized dance notations is through their interpretation of these folk dances. And that's, I think that can be put in conversation with the idea of hybridity. On the other question that Anusha posted about 
what the affective experience is from the other side. Definitely, that's the case. In fact, um, that's something that I'm, I mean, that's something that I'm really interested to look into and I hope to um, do that moving forward in the graduate school. Um, but one of my reading lists in particular that I'm gonna pass to Anusha <laughs> tomorrow is that a, a, a capstone project written by Marisa Montoya, and she's a fourth generation Mexican-American who joined Filipino Cultural Nights. She was Mexican-American and joined Filipino Cultural Nights and saw all these intersections of um, her Spanish heritage and a Mexican heritage to that of the Filipino dances. And for her, her experience was different. And I would like to quote one of the things that she said um, very quickly. She said that, quote, by recognizing their history, that is of the Filipino history of colonization, through the continued performance of dances with colonial influences, both the Philippines and Mexico display their survival through colonization. So in, in a way, her viewpoint and her experience of engaging with Filipino folk dances as a Mexican-American was a different story to how I experienced it um, with Filipino-Americans in the same preparations for the same event. So that was a really um, a, an eye-opener for me to see that perspective from some, someone who, ha who has participated also in the, almost the same rehearsals or um, and show that she has been to. Um, and also just to extend that, then this question of what is it then for Filipino Americans themselves, mostly second generation who has not been to the Philippines, what does it mean for them to engage in a cultural practice such, a, such as folk dance? So I think um, that's something that the that, uh, direction of my research would also go into. Um, yes, and, and just to, very, very um, slightly point out um, Eric's question on the hegemonic totality as a political act, especially for Filipino dancing bodies in particular. I think engaging with folk dance is always political, though what I pointed out in my presentation was how sometimes this is not put in conversation at all. Um, and in fact, in some of my papers where I try to, to discuss or point out these nuances of Filipino bodies engaging with folk dance, I, I already receive a lot of criticisms just because these are in place already from where, almost in place from where I came from. And when I was in the Philippines, I did not question it as well. But when I came over here and saw it from afar, you know, like I saw my country from afar and saw how these Filipino Americans are engaging with these folk dances. It was a different experience. It was weird, but also how, um, of course, um, the experience of being in graduate school and being with um, prolific and amazing dance professors really helped a lot for me to think through um, what it means for me to engage in Philippine folk dance. So yeah. I really love the way that you you localize yourself within your talk. I wanted to say that before, but also I actually think that Fernando Ortiz's transculturation read with Homi Baba might be a fruitful way of going at it, even though I think Ortiz is, you can be, it can be read as apolitical. I don't think it, I think a lot of people also read it as political, obviously, but it might be something. And it's also w dealing with Spanish colonial world. So you may see some, especially focus on neoculturation. That's, 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 I think the part of Ortiz that everybody skips on, but great work. All right. Thank you. So I'm aware that we uh, want to leave space for Preeti to respond, um, as have the other two speakers. I'm also looking at the time and make sure that we're respectful of our time as well. But Preeti, do you want to share some comments or thoughts? Um, I'll just response? Let me really quick. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, I just want to echo uh, what Jen said um, with regards to Eric, your comment about the political, that what you said is going to stick with me. And I, I think I'm going to be thinking about um, whether something, whether uh, some of what I pointed out has to be political. And I, I think that that's something that I, I need to think about because I have been operating under the, or, or have I been operating under the assumption that we are ignoring the political 
uh, or people are in, or per performers are ignoring the political and what 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 to differentiate between those means um, what the meaning of that w um, would be um, and so uh, I, I think that that's like a really productive place um, Anusha I think uh, we have like a lot of, and we can talk later don't worry a lot more yeah yeah so um, but thank you so much um, for letting me share this uh, beginning and, and I, I don't want to take up any more any more time but thank you it's your time. It's your time to take. I didn't mean to suggest that you oh, didn't. No, no, I understand. I appreciate it. Yeah. So before we um, release ourselves back into our day, I, I'm aware that we have other folk bearing witness to these talks and we have questions or comments. And we, we can take another five minutes if that's all right and just open up the floor a little bit here. Uh, are, is, would anyone like to contribute some thoughts or comments or questions for our speakers? Go ahead, Anthony. I see. I see that hand. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This everyone did such an excellent job. First of all, um, that was fantastic. I'm just wanting to follow up on Jen's comment about like what enabled the experience of ambivalence, or sort of what led to that, and what sort of created the space for critique and thinking about preview paper two, and like where, how do we understand? what enables you to identify that critique and um, Dem's comment about sort of distance and trying to reconcile that with the fact that you're both like very, very expert proficient practitioners as well. So and I, I think I'm really interested now in how, how do we think about what your embodied knowledge of the forms that you're, crit you're critiquing um, like how that knowledge sits alongside or comes into intersection or relationship with either the knowledge that's produced by being sort of transnational or moving across places or sort of just the sort of critical lenses of um, our, our discipline. Um, I, I, it feels important to me to like think about those three intersecting somehow um, as all different kinds of embodied knowledge that allow you to perform the critique that you perform. So I, it's not a it's not a question, just a comment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to jump in with a comment or question? They say when you're facilitating a meeting that you should wait 10 seconds to allow people to really think. But I sit here on Zoom and I think, wow, that's an eternity. <laughs> um, so I see uh, Linda's question in the chat um, asking about recordings. Thank you. That's a terrific question. So the Zoom is recording and we will um, we'll do some slight editing. We had a pre meeting meeting that we we'll want to trim off the recording and then we'll we'll have just the talks and the responses available um, no later than Wednesday of next week we'll post those online and we'll make sure that we, we push out those links I hope to have it much sooner than that um, but we'll, we'll get it out to you early next week so if there are no further thoughts I want to offer a sincere thanks to all three of our speakers today and to both respondents to everyone who came this has been deeply encouraging for me as, as, a, as a person listening, so I hope it was for you as well for sharing your work. So thank you, bless you, be well, and I hope to see you all in person at a not too distant date. <laughs> so take thank care. Thank you, Catherine. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you for organizing this. Thank you all, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Have a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye.